Well, I'm honored to be here. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes given the current situation. Uh, some of you know or have attended uh, the WWDVC conference in the US. Some of you don't know that I have one. So WWDVC, Worldwide Data Vault Consortium, every year for the last seven or eight years running. Uh, you can ask John Giles or Knowles Everson or a few others uh, who have been there uh, about the experience. Um, this year, however, due to all the current issues going on, we will be offering live streaming. So if you cannot make it for a variety of reasons, um, you can still subscribe or sign up for a seat and we will send you a live streaming link. We won't be announcing that publicly until about two weeks ahead of the event, which starts in May. Excuse me. <clears throat> no, I don't have an issue. I just the uh, air conditioner in the room last night was on, so I apologize. I've been drinking water all morning. Uh, but that's the, uh, that's the uh, conference and the, the way the conference goes, um, how, we, how we run. So we will also have some remote conference speakers. So without further ado, we're going to move along here. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about bridging the gaps. So those of you who know me know I like to tell stories and know that I'm long-winded. I'm not exactly sure exactly how long this presentation is going to go, but I'll try to keep it within an hour. So we'll go from there. So bridging the gaps, what does that all mean? Uh, just to show off hands, how many of you know what a data vault is? OK, how many of you want to know what a data vault is? <laughs> OK. So <clears throat> we're going to cover a little bit of that. So industry predictions. I like to talk a little bit about what the industry is saying about data. Size of the data, what's happening in the industry, where are we going. The first prediction here is by IDC. By 2025, that's in five years, five years from now, IDC predicts that we will have 163 zettabytes of data. So if you think you're not dealing with big data today, get ready because it's coming. All right, it's coming to a store near you or it's coming into your warehouse. It's going to hit you. So there's no time like the present to be prepared for tomorrow and for the things that are uh, coming your way. So you definitely want a solution that helps you with this thing. The next uh, prediction was by Gartner. And uh, by 2022, that's in two years, 30% of organizations will use explainable AI models. Well, what does that say about today's AI models? I think this one is a little aggressive. I don't think explainable AI is that close around the corner because if you ask any data scientist today to explain how the model arrived at its decisions, most of them don't know and they can't trace the data through the model or they can't trace the process by which the AI engine uses to make its decisions. So when we talk about explainable models, we start talking about governance, we start talking about auditability, we start talking about traceability, and yes, this stuff is gonna to come to pass, but it's gonna probably, in my estimation, take another three or four years after that. So about 2025 is, is what I think uh, a majority of the people will have. We've got another one here, a lack of data science skills. What does that say in the marketplace? Well, when we're dealing with data science, right, I have a personal belief. I think that every one of us that deal with data on a day-to-day -day basis will have to have some form of knowledge of data science. Whether you're a BA, a business analyst, or whether you're in IT, you're building, or whether you're a, a data integrator, a specialist, or whether you're a data architect or a modeler, I think data science skills are gonna become one of those fundamental things that we all need to learn. So take heed, take notice. I think this is the future. I think it's going to be embedded or entrenched in everything we do. So this is interesting, but data science skills will inhibit 75% of the organizations who deal with, in this case, IoT data. Now, I don't think it's limited to just IoT. I think this prediction is good, but I don't think it's wide enough I think it's it, IoT, I think IoT is only one subset. And yeah, IoT is basically machine generated data. We all know that. So anytime you have machines that are generating data sets from heartbeats in hospitals to sensors on roadways, I think IoT is here to stay, including sensors inside of store, stores. As you enter a store, you're gonna go shopping, they're counting you. They're also doing facial recognition across cameras, CCTV cameras and, and other things like that. So we've got machine-generated data in all forms, from images to audio to video to everything else. 
And I think we're gonna see a lack of data science skills in the quote data warehousing BI industry as well. So this is something that I feel strongly about. I think if you don't have any plans today in learning data science, I think you should in the future. I think this is really where uh, the future of our jobs are gonna be. So let's move ahead a little bit, talk about IoT devices by 2020. And this is a, an IDC statement. Um, IoT will consist of 30 billion uh, devices collecting data. So this is a rough estimate, there's no way to know. I think the number is a lot higher. If we count the roadway sensors, we count the cars that are getting embedded, we count the Alexa devices and the Google Home devices and all kinds of other things. In fact, the internet is one large machine that generates data. So anytime you collect metrics off of cloud services or metrics off of your web, uh, web productions, that's all IoT generated data. All of this stuff is gonna come to bear in your BI and analytics solutions, whether you like it or not. So this is very, very important. It isn't so much how much data, although that's a concern. How do we store it? How do we move it? How do we manage it? So much as it is, how do we make use of it, right? You could have hundreds of heartbeat and in pieces of information, like three columns or four columns of data that are all numeric. How do you know what the data means? How do you make sense of the data? How do you turn it into business information, right? It's raw data, it's just numeric, it's three columns. And this is what data scientists ask the question. Now the common response in our industry is to say, well look, we're gonna run profiling on that data, we'll figure it out. But you need more than that. And I think we all know profiling isn't enough. We need metadata, we need good governance, we need to talk to the business users. We've got to collaborate and figure out where this data is coming from and how it's defined. It doesn't do you any good if you write a data science algorithm that declares these three columns as this kind of metadata that comes off of, say, an air quality sensor. And you say, well, this one team says this comes off an air quality sensor, so these numbers mean the wind speed, the humidity, and the temperature. And another team looks at that same data and goes, no, 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 it doesn't come off an air quality sensor. It comes out of a car exhaust system. Right? So you've got the same data set being defined two different ways. And this is what happens with split teams. This is what happens without good governance, is you get metadata that doesn't equal, doesn't add up. And of course, they're going to, again, produce IoT models or data science models that produce different answers. So you have to have governance involved to handle this. Now, the other thing that um, we talk about here is IDC. This is the last one I'm going to uh, put forward for you as far as industry predictions. IDC for security, only half the information that should be protected actually will be, and we already see this. You guys have heard about all the breaches that have gone on from Experian uh, to credit reporting agencies to healthcare systems to US government uh, sites to uh, commercial companies, you know, including Facebook, one of the biggest leakers, and they openly leak data. It's like, here, you want some? Here, you can have it. We're gonna ask questions later to see whether we're in compliance. There's nobody from Facebook in here today, is there? Just, just thought I'd check, right? I don't have anything against them, I just don't use them because I don't like them. Like everyone else, I've got a profile on Facebook and how that happened is a whole nother story that I won't get into today. All right, so protecting information, but in order to protect it, first you have to identify it, right? You've gotta know what you've got. And then you have to govern it. If you don't have good governance policies, you can't secure what you're dealing with, right? So governance is number one. Metadata is number two, right? So data science is number three. Because of the volumes of data, we have to use machine learning algorithms to figure out how best to fit the data set. Where are the outliers? If we have machine-generated data, well, machines occasionally go bad. Machines make mistakes. Machines might generate invalid data sets or outliers. So we have to find a way to determine which data set are outliers and don't belong and which data set actually do belong in our estimations, right? <clears throat> so these are some of the things that we need to be concerned with. Now, if I move a little forward and I start talking about analytics issues or BI issues, it's the same pattern. The very first thing that we have, now you notice lack of data scientist training. Well, we've got lack of training in BI and analytics. Now, it isn't lack of training for, for lack of experience. It's lack of training at an enterprise level. 
When was the last time you actually took a course that focused on more than one data mart, that tried to say, hey, look, from source to target, here's all your lineage, here's how the data gets moved, and tracks the version control, tracks the governance, tracks all of the pieces in between on how it ends up on a dashboard so that when a business user, i.e. a CFO, for example, or a C-level director, can go in and look at that data and say, where did it come from and how did I get this number? You can answer that question auditably. This is what this is about. You've got to have training and good skills in order to make these things happen. And of course, if you have a lack of training, you're probably going to have a lack of governance or a lack of standards. Agile is great. That's a good statement. Agile is great. Split governance is not so good for certain things. Distributed governance works well if you have an enterprise standard that all the teams follow. Now, I used to build systems for Lockheed Martin. Some of you have heard a lot of those stories. I'm just going to share one of them with you today. Um, Lockheed Martin is a US rocket manufacturer, among other things. Now, just to give you an idea, Lockheed Martin is 159,000 employees, seven sectors all over the world. They're a global company. So their seven sectors are divided into 53 independent companies, all managed by their own P&L. Trying to do anything enterprise at Lockheed, the very first question is, which sector are you in? Astronautics was the sector I was working in. Now, astronautics was responsible for launching rockets. So you have to have good governance. Now, I had split teams. I had split teams. I had teams in Japan who built parts of the rocket. I had teams in Denver who built parts of the rocket. I had teams in Cape Canaveral where we launched rockets. And by the way, one of my customers was NASA. So we supported the launch missions of the shuttle, right? So we had lots and lots of things going on, lots of companies. I remember dealing with 52 different suppliers, and these are just rocket parts suppliers. And you try to talk about integrations across 52 companies, right? So one of the other things about uh, Lockheed Martin is we had 125 source systems that we had to ingest with a team of three and a half people, and we had to do it in six months. Without good governance, without good standards, you can't accomplish those goals. By the way, we succeeded, and I, I, about every three years I hear from somebody on the inside that is still running today. This was between 1990 and 2000, okay? So this is where the data all came from. But you've got to have good standards. The team in Japan has to work in a similar fashion as the team in Denver, as the team on Cape Canaveral. This is the point. Without an enterprise governance, without enterprise standards, you can't do distributed governance. In other words, the team in Japan would not have the same run rates or production uh, uh, and abilities. In other words, what took the team in Denver two weeks might take the team in Japan four weeks to do because they do it differently. So this is part of the problem. You've got to have good standards for that. Now, we all have heard this term data lake. I have a very, very opinionated view on what a data lake really is and isn't. You'll hear some of that from James later today in the master class, um, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. Uh, but data lakes, in my opinion, are, uh, well, they're not well defined, so we'll leave it at that. But there's, there's a whole lack of uh, uh, usability of data lakes because there's a lack of governance and lack of standards. All of this stuff leads to a lack of solid BI strategy at the enterprise level. There's a lot of executives that just talk to their IT director and say, go build one. And the IT director says, I've got 400 people. I'm going to divide them into teams of 10. And they all can race the race, right? One team is a data science team. And they don't collaborate, right? So there's collaboration problems across data science, which all lead to, obviously, an inability to deliver, whether it's defining AI and ML outcomes or whether it's uh, defining BI outcomes or analytic outcomes. They're all the same. So this cycle repeats itself. Unfortunately, this is a downward spiral. It all star starts with a lack of good training. You need to be trained in enterprise methods and processes in order to achieve the successes and the goals. So moving along, there are some other things out there on the web. Now, we all know that the web doesn't always tell the truth. Anybody with me on that one? Anybody believe that the internet is completely 100% true all the time? It's a loaded question. Come on. If you're not going to laugh at my jokes, at least laugh at me. I know I'm funny looking. Come on. It's, 
lighten up a little bit here. All right, so don't believe everything you hear. You may have heard some things, and these are common things I hear from industries telling me all the time. The very first thing that I hear is, you know, a data lake fixes everything, whether it's executive level or director level. Have you heard this one? Don't raise your hands, it's self-incriminating. It's a joke, folks, come on. All right, it's okay to laugh, even in, in, in this environment. Okay, so we don't need to understand the data, just dump it in the data lake. This definition of a data lake is not a data lake, it's a file dumping zone. It's simply a file store that's organized by, well, you got it, folders, and you dump data in. In comes data from this source system, just keep dumping it in. There's no delta tracking, there's no processing, there's no profiling, and then what do they do? They say, oh, we have the raw data, just give it to the BI tool, right? That's self-service, wrong again. That is a Pandora's box of misinformation. So the end result is this, right? You get everything from lack of solid foundations to integration, lack of auditability, that's a big one. Uh, toxic data dump is what I call it. Anybody hear this one? Right, so what if you haven't heard that one? What if you heard this one? We're all agile all the time. Who cares what kind of platform we're on or what kind of data we're dealing with? Agility will fix it. We will cycle fast to fail hard. And if, if that team fails, we'll just shut it down and restart it, start a new team and put new teams on new data. And then we'll find an answer. Sooner or later, the answer will bubble to the top. Wrong, right? That also is wrong. You can't build an enterprise analytics solution this way. And if you haven't been in this environment, that's awesome because these environments actually exist. It's a scary thought. Lack of collaboration, lack of consistency, lack of repeatability, right? How did you get that answer six months ago? Well, I took Power BI and I ran this one model or I put an AI ML engine and I ran this model and that was six months ago. Can you reproduce it? The business asks or the auditor asks. And then the data scientist says, well, let me think. No, I can't because I've changed the model since then. That was four months old. No governance, no version control, no common repository, no check-in, right? So the data scientists were just given free reign or the BI tool and the business analysts were given free reign over the raw data sitting in a file store. Is that appropriate? Probably not, right? So we don't wanna do that. Well, our data scientists can do this. Just Forget IT, forget data warehousing. Luckily, this one has died out over the last year and a half, two years. I don't know if you've heard this before, but this was when data science first became the hot buzzword. Everybody was ditching their IT teams. We'll just go around them. Well, there's a couple of stories that occurred in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago now. There's about two, three years ago. These two data scientists were brought in, and this is not a joke, folks. These two data scientists were brought in um, and one data scientist said to the other, no, I'm just kidding. They, <laughs> two data scientists were brought into this organization, this well-known organization, and this was written up in the Wall Street Journal, and they abandoned all the IT practices, all the good practices that we'd had over the last 20 years, all the things that we developed that we knew worked were completely abandoned. And they said to the data scientists, go build this answer set. So these two data scientists came out with an answer. It got to the CFO, and then all of a sudden, the CFO and the CEO decided to shut down the company for two days. This was a trading company, by the way. And can you imagine the amount of impact or monetary loss that this had on the company because they got the wrong answer? Because they didn't have any productionalization governance. There was no QA, no QC. They just built the models, thought the answer was good enough and sent it up the chain to the CFOs. If you have this going on in your organization, I encourage you to rein it in immediately, all right? So this leads to long lead times. It also leads to unhappy data scientists, why? Well, the number one job that the data scientists learn very quickly that they have to do is something we've been doing for years. This is the most expensive ETL, ELT programmer you'll ever hire. And the number one job that they're handed is profiling. We've been doing profiling. Data scientists, they're not hired to do profiling. They shouldn't even be doing profiling. So we need to increase our collaboration with the data scientists to make this work. That's the key to success. Don't disclude them. Don't cut them out. Don't put them on their own path. We need enterprise governance. We need a management. We need an agreement with them. 
We're not going to stop them from building models. We're not going to stop them from accessing raw data, but we can enable them. We have all the profiling facilities. We have all the metadata and the best practices for understanding how this data fits in the organization. The other thing that happens is if we don't collaborate with them, right, we get multiple copies. Why? Because the data science team will go, well, we don't know where this data is. We'll go pull it again. And if you've got this problem, you've got four, five, six, seven, ten different copies of the same data set running around, each with different columns in it. Anybody experienced that one? Yeah, this is a pain in the butt. So you definitely don't want that. You want more collaboration. You want more governance, more standards. What we tell the data science teams are as follows. It's okay to do everything you want to do. You do whatever you need to do, we'll give you access, we'll work together. We'll even take profiling off your hands. And I can't tell you how many data scientists are actually happy to hear that. You mean I can go back to doing AI stuff? Yeah. And oh, by the way, we'll enrich it with the data warehouse. We'll take data out of the warehouse and give it directly to you after it's been enriched or integrated by Business Key. Right? And they go, this is great. Now I have more data than I can throw a stick at, which is wonderful. And it's been curated to a some point. It's been pre-processed. And it's been defined and, and understood. Right? So we don't want to pay attention to that. I've heard this one, too. We don't need fill in the blank. We don't need modeling. All we need is, is just a, a, a data science tool, an AI, and ML algorithm. We don't need data modeling. Who needs data modeling? Throw, throw Power BI on it and manipulate it at the end user level. Well, that doesn't work. We don't need metadata. Who needs metadata? We'll define it in the BI tool itself. That's the wrong approach as well. Again, ungoverned. You get two different people seeing the same file. They look at the column. They interpret the metadata differently. There's no governance. Of course the numbers on the BI tool aren't going to match if you have this problem. And let me tell you, if you're producing answer sets for executives, that isn't going to fly. Right, because the stuff doesn't match. So you get privacy breaches, you get data leaks, you get chaos, you get no architecture. And when you have no architecture, things fall down, things fall over, you get a lack of teamwork. You get everybody for themselves. And this is the Pandora's box of, quote, self-service. I hate the term self-service. I much prefer managed self-service BI. So even if you don't build a data vault model, you can use some of the things that we have in the methodology around Data Vault to manage your environment, to improve governance, right? So you want to avoid exposure and fines. I've heard this one as well. People say, well, for Data Vault, I thought, I thought we could just read the book. I thought we could read the book, build a Data Vault, and we'd be good to go. We don't need training. Wrong again. There's something about 10 years of research and design from 1990 to 2000, which the Data Vault is made up of. 30,000 test cases. Unfortunately, I can't release them because they are owned by Lockheed Martin, the IP, right? There's something about 10 years of research and design that you just can't write into a 600-page book. If I were to write all the knowledge into a book that came out of that 10 years, I would have 10 volumes of 1,000 pages each. That's sort of where it would start cutting the ice, right? So beyond the tip of the iceberg. But as it is, we do cover quite a bit of ground in the training, right? Even though it's certified Data Vault 2.0 practitioner. I get directors through there. I get managers through there. Why? Because language is important. Standards are important. Governance is important. You improve language and standards, or the standard of language and the definitions that everyone uses. You improve communication. You improve communication, you improve agility. You improve agility, everything starts to run smoother. You're no longer arguing over what to call a data warehouse or what to call a customer key. Everybody tends to agree to standard definitions. So training is important. You can't just go it alone. Reading the book is a good way to get your fingers wet to understand what the data vault is, but it only gives you a, a, a bird's eye view of the tip of the iceberg. Right? The result is lack of training, lack of proper design. And what happens is, in the environments that build it, usually only one person has tried it out. And then the organization looks at it and goes, well, that's a failure. We're going to shut that down and go back to what we know. Is what we know working for you, or has it worked for you for the last 20 years? If it is working for you, then don't change it. Good for you. Right? Don't fix what isn't broken. 
But if it's not working for you, why go back to the old ways? This is the question I have. We were told the data vault was a one-time build. We got all the training, we got all the people, we built it, and then, then what? Right? We thought it would just run. No, you need continuous maintenance. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. If you don't continually maintain it, maintain it it's gonna fall into disrepair. Workers begin to cut corners. There's attrition of staff, knowledge leaves the company. When knowledge leaves the company, these things fall down. These things aren't maintained. They, they go by the wayside. So we want to avoid that. But going back to uh, what you know, what is the definition of insanity? Anybody? Say it with me. Doing the same thing over and over again and... Thank you. Expecting a different answer. So if you really want to go back to the old ways of doing things, even though they weren't working for you, be my guest. But you might as well prepare to fail because you've been failing. And we've all seen this, right? We've all seen this in 20 years. What does business do? They start off with a Kimball design. They build it up over six months. It's in the first six months, it's beautiful. And then eight months later, nine months later, teams slow down. Development gets complex. This same goes for industry logical data models if they're built in a physical fashion. You build them up, you build them up, you build them up. Agile is fast and sleek in the beginning, but as time goes on, after two, three years of this, you iterate, eventually, what was a two-week piece of work becomes a, a six-month or a three-month build. And then the business goes, I can no longer afford the time, I can't afford the cost, I can't wait anymore. Greenfield it, shut it down. And one of three things happen. Either they'll outsource the entire thing to another company who comes right back in and builds exactly the same thing they just had, Right? Shows them pretty, pretty objects, shiny objects. We can do that in three months, and they build it for one silo. The second thing that happens is the internal team says, well, that didn't work, so we're going to do it this way. And they build it the same architecture, the same design, the same method, and they end up with silo solutions all over again. So we definitely don't want to do that. So let's change the way we think. Let's change what we do, right? So my question to you is, what does your current foundation look like? So you all know what this is, right? This is the Sydney Harbor Bridge, for those of you who aren't from Sydney. So the Sydney Harbor Bridge, my question to you is, what does it take to build a bridge like this? <clears throat> well, the first thing is it takes architecture. That's the very first thing. If you don't have blueprints, if you don't have architecture, if you don't have design, you can't build an enterprise bridge. You can't build a massive project. This is a big project. This isn't like going out in your backyard with a few sticks and building, you know, digging, uh, digging in the dirt like I used to with matchbox cars. Everybody know what matchbox cars are? Yeah, the little cars that we play with when we're kids, right? Digging, digging a little hole in the, in the ground and putting a couple matchbox sticks across. That's not what we're doing here, right? We're building an, a, a massive bridge to support traffic, all kinds of traffic. We need an architecture. We need design. We need a plan. We need crew leaders. We need craftsmen, workers. We need training. We need standards. Look at that, we gotta have standards. We gotta have a, a common way of building a bridge. We gotta have quality checks, governance, good processes, controls. We need technology. In the, in the bridge's case, we need materials and machines, right? And in the Sydney Bridge, they used a lot of machines. One of the machines they used heated the rivets to a certain temperature so that they could insert the rivets. And then they would expand as they got colder, locking the rivet in place. Right? One of the other machines they used was a crane on the top of the bridge. You see the cranes on the top of the bridge. They used the crane to lift the heavy bridge materials. There's no way that a human could take one of these girders, these heavy girders, and lift them into place. They had to use cranes to do it. So what would happen if you didn't have architecture or design or you didn't have any planning? You just decided you were going to build a Sydney Harbor Bridge, gather a bunch of your mates from a bar, and go build a Sydney Harbor Bridge. Well, unfortunately, this is what happens in your enterprise data warehousing efforts. You've got to stop the practice. If you want to change the outcome, you've got to change the way you do business. This is the point. Would the bridge beat, meet in the middle if you didn't have architecture or design, if you didn't have blueprints? No. If you weren't precise in your engineering, if you weren't precise in your measurements, would the bridge meet in the middle? No. Can you build an enterprise class data warehouse? without being precise in your engineering? No. 
Okay, so these are important things to think about. Now, if you build the bridge on a weak foundation, if you built it on sand, what would happen to the foundation of the bridge? It would sink. So there's a lot of engineering that has to go in. How much weight? How is the weight distributed? What's going to happen when the wind blows? I've got external factors affecting the bridge, right? Now, here's an interesting question. What if workers cut corners? What if you had bridge workers that were fully trained, that were governed, that knew the process, and they went out and said, you know what, I'm in this team and I can do things differently. What do you think would happen to the bridge? We'll be faster than the other team because we can cut corners. Well, this is what happens in enterprise data warehousing projects. I know better than the enterprise architect because I saw how this worked over here in this company and I can come in and I can make it better, faster, cheaper, and they end up screwing the whole thing up, right? So would this bridge sustain the weight of the cranes? Would it fall apart in the first windstorm? Would it pass the safety inspection? How many data warehouses have you built or enterprise BI solutions have you built that have actually been audited, that have actually been assessed or reviewed? And I'm not just talking about the data warehouse, the model or the data. I'm talking about the people, the teams, the environment, the governance, the metadata, the process controls how you do your work. This is what I'm talking about, okay? So what would happen? I mentioned this earlier. What would happen if the teams skipped rivets? What if the teams decided distributed governance and the, and the guy said, you know what? Whoever gets there first gets the biggest bonus. What if that was the incentive? Yep, lots of people died on this bridge. Lots of people, there was all kinds of issues on this bridge. But if people skip standards in a data warehouse, now I'm gonna bring this to a point, thank you John, but I'm gonna bring this to a point. I built an enterprise data warehouse for Lockheed Martin. The end result of the BI and the analytics went to people that made decisions about rockets that launched human beings. If we didn't have precise engineering in the BI answer set, if we couldn't prove how these numbers were governed and, pr and produced, what do you think would have happened to more of those rockets that NASA launched? Just think about that. There's a human life cost at the end of the tunnel in some of these engineering processes. So the data vault methodology and the data vault model and everything else underneath it was built with extremely low tolerance for failure. Extremely low tolerance. And this is why if you do any reading on the web, you see me jump up and down when someone says, I can do it my own way. I can break the data vault standards and look, it works. Yeah, it works for your small mom and pop shop, one register company. It will not work at an enterprise scale. In fact, it will do exactly the opposite and fail worse than what you were doing previously. So following standards once established is extremely important, extremely important, right? So the automation tools, the cranes could not be used because if you skip rivets, you can't support the weight of the cranes. They would fall right into the ocean, right? Or in the inlet. So let's talk about maintenance. This is the other piece with BI tools that, that comes along. What about maintenance? You know, we often forget, we build it, we congratulate ourselves, it looks nice, it runs for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden people leave, uh, the knowledge goes, and we forget. We forget how it was built, we forget why it was built, we forget why the standards were so important. What about maintenance? Well, let's take a look at the maintenance of the bridge. What does it take to keep this bridge standing? Well, you've got lots of things. Consistency, repeatability, solid foundation, trained workers. There it is again, training, right? Good governance, inspections, and assessments but continuous maintenance is the biggest one. Once you have all those other pieces, continuous maintenance is a process that must be followed. And continuous maintenance has to follow all kinds of standardized, rigorous processes. Let's take one of these processes, just one. Let's take the process of painting. Now, when you go home and you wanna paint your wall green, for whatever reason, you can go down to the hardware store, the paint store, buy your paint that morning, you can get up that morning and make that decision, come home and paint your wall green. And if you don't like it, then tomorrow you can paint it blue, right? It's up to you whether or not you fill the holes in the wall. It's up to you whether or not you take the old paint off. Now, anybody who knows anything about woodwork knows that if you don't, if you, if you try to paint a surface, a wood surface that has previously been finished, 
uh, you, if you don't sand it, the paint won't stick, right? Eventually it all peels off. But this is the problem. So if you look at the bridge, even something as simple as repaint, repainting the bridge has a number of process steps that have to be followed. A number of process steps. And I'm not even talking about all the maintenance cycles and all the processes that are there. But this is a governed approach. That's why this works. That's why the bridge continues to stand and be safe. But you look at painting and you go down to this one work cycle, even the work cycle is defined. So in the data vault, we have processes that are defined for moving data. We also have processes in the methodology for the way you gather requirements, for the way you define your model, for the way you define and manage your metadata and your outcomes. These are all very important. In terms of painting the bridge, you have to remove the corrosion. If you don't remove the corrosion, you paint over it, it will fall apart. The corrosion continues unless you get rid of it. So there are steps there. You have to get the stuff that's busted out of the way. You have to remove the things that aren't following standards out of the way before you can go ahead. Now, I don't know if, how many of you know about the Golden Gate Bridge, but the Golden Gate print, print, uh, sorry, painting cycle is 365 days a year. They'll paint from one side to the other, turn around and start again and paint back the other way. So this is how the Golden Gate Bridge gets maintained. The maintenance never stops. So if you have a data vault or a data warehouse based on data vault, don't stop the maintenance just because you think it's done. It's not. It's an enterprise data warehouse. It needs care and, and feeding, okay? So let's talk about achieving something better. Let's talk a little bit about where you can go from here. Now, obviously, in order to stop what you're doing, you have to change the way you think. And that's what the data vault brings to the table. You really want to change the way you think. So don't think of data vault as just a data model. It isn't. It's so much more than that. It's a model, it's a methodology, it's an architecture, it's governance process, it's the way you work. It's a cultural shift in how you build enterprise solutions. Now here's a tidbit. Data Vault is being used in Department of Defense in the US, National Security Agency in the US, a number of intel organizations, large banks all over the world. We probably have over 4,000 organizations, most of them well known using Data Vault at the enterprise level. Okay, so what is Data Vault? It's a system of information management. Okay, system of information management with enterprise vision. It's people, process, and technology. It's standards, governance, maintenance, controls, and execution. So how you operate within your best practices. It's so much more than just a data model. If you read the web, the only thing you get off the web is data vaults a data model. Wrong? That's wrong. That's only one piece of it, right? If you read the web, the other thing you'll get is data vault is, is, uh, is, is a third number form data warehousing storage. That's also wrong, all right? So the data vault components, we've got modeling, methodology, and architecture. We also have implementation standards. These are just some of the benefits that we have along the way. Now, Data Vault was born over 10 years inside of Lockheed Martin, an enterprise that was driving CMM, capability maturity models. So we had to drive enterprise delivery under capability maturity. We had to get better, faster, cheaper. Now, I told you already, team of three and a half people, 125 source systems ingested in six months, 3,000 feeds. Okay, into our data warehouse and out to our analytic. We had 5,000 reports to produce. Now what we did was not self-service BI, we did managed self-service BI. We produced a logical business model that the business then went out and appointed specific business analysts responsible for producing their own reports. That sounds familiar because today that's known as self-service BI end and the tools today are much better than they were in 1994. So this was done between 1990 and 1990, uh, 2000, okay? So some important things, but we wanna manage risk, we wanna manage governance. The other thing that Lockheed said was we need an auditable data warehouse. We need a traceable data warehouse. We need to be able to determine where this data came from, why? May I remind you, the end results were used to affect people's lives, right? The end results coming out of the BI tool had an impact on how the engineering was done on rockets that launched people into space. 
If the numbers were wrong, people died. Right? So this is very, very important. We had to prove that numbers were balanced, that we had governance, that we had auditability and traceability all the way through the metadata layers, all the way out. So very important to think about that. We have modeling benefits as well. And nowadays, the technology has caught up. So one of the things I want to stop and just talk about briefly here, there's a lot of technology available today that will do better, faster, cheaper in terms of performance using a third normal form style model with some releases of or removal of foreign keys. So this is about as technical as we get today. Um, in those cases, what we do is we say, OK, we're going to build the data vault model in a logical fashion. Logical fashion. And then when we go to produce, we may very well produce it in a physical optimized format. We built a data vault on MongoDB. MongoDB doesn't have the capability of handling all the split objects, so we denormalize them. We use the physical model or the logical model that's data vault follows as hubs, links, and SAS and the division of work. We use the physical model in Cassandra and Mongo. There's another story where we built one in Cassandra recently, and some of you know about that. Um, if you want to know about that more, talk to Noel Everson. He's, he's in the room somewhere. He'll be up later. So, um, so there are ways to optimize at a physical level. Okay, so some interesting things around the model. So don't just think that we have to build the physical model in accordance with the data vault standards. No, we optimize depending on the platform. Okay, architecture benefits, obviously. And, and one of the things I want to uh, just briefly say is when I talk about modeling, it's not just about data modeling. The data vault brings process modeling, data modeling, team modeling. Right? So there's all kinds of different models that go in there, systems modeling. Architecture, when I say architecture, everybody thinks it's systems architecture. That's only one piece. We have data architecture. We have DevOps architecture. We have process architecture. There's lots of different pieces to architecture to think about. All of these things have been engineered. If you stick with the standards, if you learn how to build, and you stick with the standards, you will achieve success. You will inherit the benefits. So just like Henry Ford did with an assembly line of cars, we do with data warehouses. You need standards, you need governance, you need common practices, you need best practices. And pretty much every auto manufacturer in the world today, in order to survive, has to use this approach. Because it has proven to be the lean and most efficient approach to building a car. I don't know of any auto manufacturer that is large enough to compete that doesn't do this, right? So what does that say? Well, that says at a particular level, there is a guaranteed process approach. It doesn't mean there won't be improvements to the process over time. There certainly will be. But there is a guaranteed approach. There's a guaranteed architecture. There's a guaranteed set of standards to follow to build. And that's what the data vault brings to the enterprise data warehousing world, right? Um, the other thing there is agile methodology. Everybody talks about agile methodology. How do you get agile? Well, the biggest thing with agile is scope. And this is something else we teach you. Many people who start with Data Vault, they start along fine, they, they, they go well, but then they release the coach. The coach doesn't come back. They don't invite them back to help them when they stumble. What they get stuck in is analysis paralysis. Or they start this false belief of, I have to build everything into my data vault model before I produce any BI outcomes. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You want to take a, a horizontal stream approach. You want to deliver. And as I'm showing here, um, I've helped numerous teams. So this is about the way you work, the process you follow, and the way you work, and the way you build. Numerous teams, team of four, can execute. Deliver in four days what previously took the team nine months to accomplish. These are real numbers from a real company. There's another team I'm going to talk about here in a minute where we took it down to one day sprints. If you want to know about that, you can see Noel Everson as well. He was on one of those teams. So one day sprints. Now, I talked to my good buddy Scott Ambler, who is Discipline Agile Methodology founder and one of the, one of the authors of the original Agile Manifesto. And I said, well, should we call it a one day sprint? He said, no, it should be an iteration. So there you have the words from Scott himself. But it really, for all intents and purposes, is a one-day sprint. So in the one-day sprint, the one thing that we don't include is profiling. 
Profiling should be its own sprint, its own piece, its own, its own work, because it may have to go back to the users, and then it may be two or three weeks before you get an answer. Profiling is a very difficult task, requires a lot of human involvement and a lot of thought for identification metadata. But when you remove that piece and say, okay, we're gonna, we, we have the profiling done, the metadata is defined, now from that point to delivery to the BI tool should be one day within a certain scope. Now I'm talking only in development, okay? QA, QC, whole nother, whole nother realm, okay? That's another set of sprints. But these are the kinds of things. So let's talk about Eckerson Group and some of the predictions. Data exchanges are the next big thing according to the Eckerson Group. We can help you with the data exchanges using the DB2 model. 2020 is the year of the graph. By the way, data vault modeling and graph modeling have been around a long, long time. Data vault modeling is based on graph mathematics. I've had some people build data vaults on graph engines or graph databases and succeed wildly more than they succeed with the data vault model on a relational engine tech. Although those relational engine techs are getting better. Case in point, Snowflake, who's here today, you want to talk to them. U.S. government will craft federal data privacy. It's not so much about the U.S. government as it is the data privacy regulations. We want to enable you. We're not going to tell you how to do the privacy. That's the job of your privacy officer and all the regulations that you follow. But we can enable you to do better privacy at the data level, the process level, controlled and governance level. So this is where we go. Right? The methodology, an ontologist. If you don't know what an ontologist is, go learn. This is your new number one job role, uh, understanding what an ontology is. It has to do with how you classify data sets, how you organize data sets, how you understand data sets. And there's a friend of mine in the room over here, John Giles. You can also talk to about ontologies and taxonomies during the breaks if you want. Some interesting stuff there. Uh, data warehousing becomes a strategic service. You can definitely talk to Snowflake about that, but the methodology helps you get there. It's not so much the platform, right? Lean, agile product management approaches go mainstream. Well, that also is the Data Vault 2 methodology. We're going to talk about this one here in just a second, and then streaming databases becoming popular. Well, we can enable streaming in real time, okay? I'll give you an example here in a minute about real time and Data Vault models. It's coming up. So time series, well, the Data Vault has any good data warehouse. The Data Vault model and methodology and process is all time-based. So you can definitely get that kind of thing. So Data Vault reaches a tipping point. Now, if you want these slides, they'll be available, um, as will the recordings. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. So we definitely be able to send these slides out. You can have them. But this was uh, Data Vault reaches a tipping point. This was the Eckerson Group. Become clear in 2020, Data Vault is the most significant improvement in data modeling since the introduction of dimensional design. Now we're talking strictly at the logical level here. Again, we physically optimize to take advantage of some of the physical platform capabilities, okay? So don't uh, take that down to the physical level. Now let's finish up <clears throat> with some of this on the case studies and benefits. These are just some things I'm, I'm gonna share with you. How has Data Vault been applied and what have been some of the results at the businesses where they built it properly? So the first one I'm gonna talk about is compliance. You've got APRA behind the label there. I don't know what happened to the font. Uh, somehow that got larger or enlarged. Uh, but meet compliance. The first company there is AXA Global Insurance. Um, we built a Hadoop-based data vault for them, a Hadoop-based data vault using Hive and Spark and all kinds of other wonderful things. They're global, so they have a global data vault. They have split teams, 150 people split into teams of 10 around the world with PII in real time, in real time. Okay, so something interesting there. Uh, people say the data vault doesn't scale and the data vault doesn't perform. Wrong. If that's the case, you need to tune your environment. Micron just finished a move from Teradata to Snowflake database. And at about last year, they were doing 3.2 trillion records across 10 manufacturing facilities from around the world in 24 hours. That's 2.2 billion records every 60 minutes. Their average table size in the data vault is 360 billion records. So don't tell me the data vault can't perform. Don't tell me the data vault can't get you sub-second query response times on tables like this, because it can. It's a matter of tuning. It's a matter of understanding how to make it work, right? So they just finished moving to Snowflake. Uh, Master Data Management, Department of Defense, Ident Insider Threat Identity Resolution using Business Key. That's a metadata component. 
right? Reduce turnaround time from four weeks to two days. I've already given you this case. This is where we start talking about one-day sprints. If you're interested in one-day sprints, let me know. But that means you have to sign up for all the rest of the things that come with the data vault, that you have to sign up with the, the standards and everything else, the best practices. Lockheed Martin, we reached CMMI within six months. Actually, it says here three months, but it took us about six months because we reached it in three months, but three months later was when the auditor from CMM or Carnegie Mellon walked in to, to actually give us the, the audit. We were the first IT team in the organization at that time to reach CMMI level five. At CMMI level five, you know you are fully optimized. That's when you can leverage automation tools like Wearscape. Now the good news is if you get into the standards and you stick with the standards of Data Vault, you can start at CMM level three and you can go from there, right? So you can very quickly reach CMM level five. Uh, anybody not familiar with that probably is familiar with the terms or labels KPA and KPI key process area and key process indicator. And if you want to talk more about that, see me after the presentation, we can talk more. All right, so how can we help you succeed? So part of this is the Data Vault Alliance. You may have noticed all the branding, it's brand new, everything we're doing. We've got this launch called the Data Vault Alliance that I want to talk to you about just briefly in the closing minutes. Um, and we are announcing, officially announcing, some of you know, we have a website out there called datavaultalliance.com and it is a community of worldwide professionals. So what's inside Data Vault Alliance that you might be able to make use of? Well, first off, discussions. We have closed and embedded discussion forums, which are very helpful. You get answers from all of the authorized trainers that I have in the world. You get answers from Certus and from Knowles. You get answers from myself. I'm out there answering questions. You get interactions with other people, practitioners around the world. What are they doing to solve a specific problem, whether it's a platform issue or an optimization issue or a process or a people issue, lots of different things. We've got e-learning. The e-learning on the site right now is a little uh, weak because I spent the last year launching the platform and making sure that the discussion groups are the first thing out the gate. We do have plans for a whole lot of e-learning courses called micro lessons, which will be an hour long segment and you can pick and choose. So those of you who have been already certified in Data Vault will have something to look forward to. We'll have new training coming on that talks about how you can advance your Data Vault skills going forward. Specialized downloads inside the community, uh, occasionally some hands-on tweaks, tips, uh, tuning techniques for different platforms and so on. So it's really a community built for you, uh, connecting you with qualified people. And I wanna make a note of this. We also connect you with authorized trainers. We connect you with authorized or certified vendors. Uh, both Wearscape is engaging with me. Snowflake is engaging with me. A number of other tools are engaging with me um, at the community level. They want to better support you. And one of the things that we hope to bring from the tool perspective um, is the ability to say, hey, I want to try the tool for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. If you're part of the community, we ship your uh, information with your approval off to the tool vendor and they hook you up, um, give you an online web access to it. All right, so why engage with us? Well, you get to mitigate the risk of failure of your data vault projects, ensure your teams are working the same way, consistently getting the right answers. So this is important. Um, you can also increase your confidence level that you're providing a, a qualified solution, right? Because if something's going wrong and you're the manager and we know it, uh, we will talk to you and say, hey, so-and-so posted this question and they either need training or you need to bring in a coach or you need an assessment or something like that to, uh, to work with it. Uh, we also offer support. Well, it's, it's a byproduct of having discussion forums and having authorized training. So sometimes a question can be answered without training classes, and we know that, and that's where the discussion forums come in. So we wanna help you with that. So why else? Well, adapt rapidly to new challenges, obviously, um, help you with your sprints, stay in compliance with your standards, figure out what's going on. We're working as a group, as a team, to move the standards forward, no, there will not be a Data Vault 3.0. As far as I know, it's not going to happen uh, over the next 10 years unless there's a major shift. But there might be a Data Vault 2.1 standard that comes out. So there's different kinds of things that are happening along those lines. Why engage? Well, you get teamwork, more engaged teams as opposed to star players. 
where they have a hammer and they say, uh, I can build it all myself. We, we definitely don't encourage the, the single star player team to go rogue and build it all themselves. Whoops, the last one we had here, and I don't know why we dropped off the last slide there. So, so why engage with DBA? We've got, um, we, as I said, we can connect you with the vendors. That's kind of a cool thing. You get a chance to get hands on with the vendors and everything else. So these are places you can go to learn more. You can ask me questions, contact me directly uh, through the website. Uh, we do have customer portals. They're not available today, but within the next three months, we'll have actually dedicated customer portals. So if you're interested in saying, well, I've got particular discussions that are sensitive, um, yet I wanna leverage DVA, and I want my employees to be there, and I wanna see what's going on, with just employees, we can sign NDAs, we can set up a customer portal, we can share documentation and other things that way as well. So that's what's coming. Um, without further ado, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.